I want to share with you an idea and a possible application of the idea. The Torah Jew ascribes to the position that every facet of human existence is theoretically available to be guided by Torah, which means that we break life into different areas. There's time, place, and people. Everything is, that happens is a coalescing, a merging, a fusion of those three variables, time, place, and people. The Torah Jew works from a premise that there's an ideal behavior that if the human being puts that configuration together in the most successful manner, he achieves what we call a mitzvah. What is a mitzvah? Normally it's translated good deed, but it's more than that. The root form of the word mitzvah is tzavta, tzav, which is to combine or unite. Tzavta is like chavruta, is like being joined. So what does that have to do doing something which is ideal with joining? Again, I'm going back now to a mystical premise that we subscribe to a thesis that the Torah preceded human existence. God, like an architect, drew up the Torah and then created life and everything, time, place, and people from this blueprint. So then, quite apart from the question of whether or not I'm going to get reward or punishment, quite apart from that, would be the ideal would be to unite myself with this plan. If this is the plan for the universe, if this is the plan for mankind, if this is the, that is what we mean by the ideal. There's a game called life, and the manufacturer of the game called life is God. And God gave a set of instructions on how best to play that game. Is it possible that I could come up with a better plan than the manufacturer? Highly improbable. From our point of view, impossible. But anybody that would allow for that possibility, let's call it improbable. From our point of view, it's impossible. Okay, so... Then there's a question of reward and punishment. Put that aside. I'd like to talk about fulfillment. That we would associate fulfillment with being happy. So we want to make a claim that the happiest person is the person who lives in rhythm with his potential and the potential of his environment and finds a synchronization between his potential and the environment around him, which means other people, resources that exist in the universe, and by combining them, joining them together, I then join to this ideal plan of what the world is supposed to be, and to the source of that, which is God, which is the supreme satisfaction and happiness. That's our claim now, doesn't mean anybody who is not learned, who isn't exposed to that claim, is going to immediately assume, well, sounds interesting, but who says you're right? right? There are different points of view. But first, before we decide how we might access whether or not this is true or not true, let's just understand what the claim is. This is our claim. Our claim is that somebody living in concert, in step with Torah, is living a fulfilled life, a more fulfilled life. It could be somebody who's not living in step with Torah has a certain percentage. 
And it's a question of percentages. This one has 10%, this one has 5%. Even the Torah Jew, who ascribes to this, and says he's committed to this, doesn't necessarily always succeed. He doesn't necessarily have a perfect batting average. But he's more likely to be more successful more often because he commits himself to that. Why is it that people can commit themselves to something and not be successful? I mean, we've all experienced it. We've experienced it with ourselves and in the environment. What would you say, how would you explain that somebody says, I believe something, but then doesn't necessarily perform according to what he believes? Firstly, you've come across that? Okay. How do you explain it? Not working hard enough. Okay. Why are we not working hard enough? Okay, so I want to go back to a definition. You're right, you're both right. But try this on for size. If a human being was a computer, then I reach a conclusion, I commit myself, this is the axiom, then everything is going to flow from that. But a human being is not a computer. A human being is a psychological entity rather than a logical entity. That's a Talmudic definition of man. What do you think I mean by the difference between psychological and logical? Sometimes they may coincide. My point is they don't necessarily coincide. And we want to take a shot. What's the difference between psychological and logical? What's the difference between a computer and the human being? There are a whole bunch of factors such as emotions and personality. Oh. There are other variables that are at work. And there's the conscious level, and then there's the unconscious level. And the unconscious level is... You guys heard of Freud? Okay. Freud's... Uh, one of his uh, disciples said Freud was convinced that there's a uniquely Jewish humor. And this was, f the story I'm going to tell you right now was Freud's favorite story according to his prime disciple. A man, a Jew, is admitted to an insane asylum. It's the first day he's there, and he asks for kosher food, and they tell him, we have no facility to provide kosher food. Goes into a hunger strike, a temper tantrum, He's not going to eat. He makes, makes all kinds of problems. They have one Jewish doctor on the staff of this mental asylum. So they call the Jewish doctor to get this patient to relent. Argues with him, fights with him, doesn't help. Screaming, hollering, hunger strike. So they have no choice till they can arrange to send this Mr. Goldberg to another to another institution. Meanwhile, they have to bus in food from a very, very distant institution. It's very costly and cumbersome. And they do it for a few days. And it comes the first Shabbos. And the doctor, the Jewish doctor who tried to persuade Mr. Goldberg to relent is walking on the grounds of the hospital. And he finds Mr. Goldberg on a lawn chair, reclining on Shabbos, smoking a cigar. So he goes running over to him. He said, I thought that you made my life miserable, demanding kosher food. I thought that you're a religious man. What are you doing smoking a cigar on Shabbos? To which Mr. Goldberg replied, remember, doctor, I'm crazy. That's a very interesting story, because I don't think Freud knew it, but F the Talmud says that a moment of sinning is a moment of temporary aberration or insanity. That if we would have, if we would not be emotional, which means, as we heard, physiological, emotional needs, then we'd be more likely to decide based on purely sense 
categories, sense in the logical sense. Now, having said that, I don't believe, I don't subscribe to the thesis that we can prove hermetically, that's 100%, rationally, that Torah is from Sinai and that it obligates us. I do believe that we can establish probabilities rationally. And I believe that the probabilities, we would all vote in favor of those probabilities if we didn't think that the price was too high, if we were logical, not psychological. So let's say that there's a, uh, we want to get to a destination called conviction, okay? That's the destination called conviction. And I start out here. So I travel with the road of my reason, and I use the vehicle of my intelligence, and then the footpath begins. The road stops, and there's a footpath. That footpath we call trust. Most people translate it faith. Maybe a problematic word, faith. Let's call it trust. But I'm going in the same direction that my reason took me. Why am I willing to grant a reliance on trust and not wait to go all the way? Because there's nothing more eminently reasonable than to understand the limitations of my reason. That in itself is a reasonable proposition. My mind will never be identical with the mind of God. And as such, I, can, I gamble my life every day on probabilities. Every time I get in a car and I travel over 50 miles an hour, I get on a plane. Statistics indicate that most planes reach their destination. Probabilities. Every time I open up a can of food, a right, certain percentage of food cans have botulism. Deathly. Highly improbable. I gamble on probabilities. That's the working thesis that we apply operatively in our lives, is that we go with certain probabilities. So the Jew comes along in history, and he says that we have a claim that if you want to live a happier, more fulfilled life, the Torah is the game plan. Aside from that, I said, there's reward and punishment. Why should I bother to consider that as a possibility? Maybe it's just an accident that I was born Jewish. How do I know that it obligates me in any way? Well, one interesting step in dealing with that is the French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, and you came across him in your studies, wrote a book on anti-Semitism. He made a very interesting point. He said, the Jew that wants to be assimilated has to deal with something that the non-Jew, the Gentile, does not have to deal with. The, non the Gentile doesn't have to deal with the world's perception of him as a Jew. And because unconsciously this Jew, since he is an emotional creature with an unconscious as well. Unconsciously, he has to grapple with that, wrestle with the world's perception of him as being incorporated into part of his own self-perception. It's an interesting little book, Jean-Paul Sartre on anti-Semitism. Some interesting points there. So there's a case to be made with understanding one's Jewishness from within rather than as a spectator from without. I have a certain amount of my life to invest. How many days, how many hours, how many minutes? It's my life. It's an investment. What does a reasonable businessman do before he makes an investment? Due diligence. He studies the investment. What's the track record? Possibilities, probabilities, maybe compare it with other investments. But if you have an investment that has been 
producing a certain amount of returns for X number of years, it deserves consideration. How many of you know what an apichorus is? Okay, an apichorus is a heretic. It's either from the root form of the word hefker, which is to abandon responsibility, or it's possibly related to Epicureans, Greek philosopher, hedonistic kind of a worldview. It could be both. So somebody who rejects the Torah already in Talmudic times was referred to as an apichorus. So there's a story, famous story, and has two versions. I'll give you both versions. Version A, man wakes up in a little small, in a small town in Poland. He decides he wants to be a heretic. He wants to be an apichorus. Goes around town. He needs somebody to tutor him. Everybody there happens to be religious. So they tell him, listen, if you're really dedicated and you want to be an apichorus, you have to go to the big city, you have to go to Warsaw, and there you're going to find a very famous heretic, Yossel the Apicurus. Now, version A, he doesn't have a, an address where to find Yossel. So you're going to look for a, an Apicurus, a heretic. Where do you look for him? He goes to the university, he goes to the museum, the state library, concert hall, all of the, what we would call the hallowed halls of culture. Doesn't find them. Begins to snow, this fellow, however much he wants to be an apicorus, he's a Jew, he naturally gravitates to the Jewish section of Warsaw, and he's trying to get in some shelter out of the snow, and he finds what we call a shtibel. Shtibel's a one-room synagogue. The Jews tend to make, build when they create their communities. Sometimes provisionally, Sometimes it remains a long time. So he walks into a shtibel, walks over to the fireplace, and there's an elderly Jew studying a folio page of the Talmud, and they begin to chat. It turns out that that's Yossel the Apikoros, Yossel the heretic, the man he was looking for in the university, in the library, in the museum, and he's sitting and studying in the shtibel a folio page of the Talmud. So to begin to speak, Yossi says to them, who are you? He said, I came to study to become an apicorus under you. He said, what do you know? He said, well, I've read Plato, Aristotle. He said, no, 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 what do you know? He thought somebody meant more modern philosophers, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche. No, no, he slaps on the gimel. He said, what do you know here? He said, I haven't studied. He said, listen, you're an am ha'aretz, you're ignorant. Am ha'aretz means somebody who's ignorant. You're an am ha'aretz. Go home and study and then come back to me. To be an apicorus is a postgraduate degree. You have to have your undergraduate credentials. You can't reject something if you don't know what you're rejecting. Learn it, and then come back to me. That's version A. There's another version we'll leave for another time. In our generation, there are very few people that have actually studied it and rejected it. Most people that are not persuaded that there is this probability or there is this specialness in Jewish learning, most of the people who don't believe that are people who never studied, overwhelmingly. Why should they bother studying? Well, you could take Jean-Paul Sartre's position and say, well, it's inescapable. It's inescapable to the world perceive you as a Jew. So shouldn't you have your own working definition of what this Jewishness is and what it's all about? Number one. Number two, we could make a case that there's a specialness to this track record of Jewishness. <coughs> Jews have succeeded in remaining Jewish. Nice few thousand years of dispersion, which defies all of the norms of anthropology <coughs> and sociology. Could it be they lucked out? Yeah. They had a lot of bad luck in persecution. They had good luck in survival, a significant percentage of them. 
Could there be a relationship between the two because people took out after them? It gave them a heightened consciousness of themselves? Could be. But why didn't that happen with somebody else? Roughly, uh, when I was age of you guys, uh, about 106 years ago, I came into a sociology class the first day of class, and the instructor was looking at the names and matching the faces with the names, right? looking at what we called a roll book then. And he comes to me, I was the only fellow with a keeper with a yarmulke in the class, and he said to me, Mr. Schiller, what are you doing here? I'd had my jousting matches with various instructors, but this was the first day of class. Didn't seem probable that somebody else tipped him off about me. So I said, what's your problem, Mr. Waterman? He said, well, you must be a student of the Talmud, Mr. Schiller. I said, I am. He said, then I have nothing to teach you about sociology. The Talmudists were the greatest sociologists of all times. If they could keep a people together over disparate, conflicting cultures, languages, countries over such an extended period of time, then everything that I might teach you about sociology, you've already learned. This was the gentle Mr. Waterman who said this to me. I looked at him and I said, Mr. Waterman, I could put you at ease. I have no intention of learning anything. I just want three credits for the course. And we got along wonderfully after that. But he was right. There is a track record which is extraordinary. Now, does that prove it's true hermetically? No. It's not one plus one equals two. But it does give me certain clues. I think it goes beyond possibilities to probabilities when you look at the prophecies that indicate that this is what's going to happen. So clearly. Number one is our track record is different than any other people. That would be impressive had it not been predicted. But add to the fact that not only is our track record different, but it in fact was <laughs> predicted that this is the way it would develop. And that's part of the problem we have in where we are today in the Middle East. Our literature and our history told us we're coming back here. Even though we're sitting in Warsaw, Brooklyn, Johannesburg, London, we're all over the place, in Buenos Aires, that we will make it back here. And then when we started making it back here and rebuilding this country, a lot of other issues that obviously have to be discussed deserve a hearing. But Suffice it to say that there was no single national entity that ever existed within these boundaries other than a Jewish state historically. It was ruled by other empires from a distance. The Romans, the Ottomans, Turkish. It never was a self-contained political entity within these boundaries other than a Jewish state. Could be a quirk of faith, but it's also interesting that this was predicted. That it, there are verses in the Torah that teach us this land is not going to work for anybody else. It's only going to work for you. I was here as a student before the Six Day War, and then I lived there after the Six Day War. It was very interesting to note the difference in the land you could tell what had been in Jewish hands and what had not been in Jewish hands. Because the land wasn't developed. Where it was in Jewish hands, it was developed. Again, that doesn't prove. But when you pile up clues, I was a big fan of Sherlock Holmes. Right? I don't know if you guys were into Sherlock Holmes, but Piling up evidence creates probabilities. I differentiate between evidence and proof. Proof finishes it. It's all over. Evidence establishes, if I was objective and reasonable, 
then this is where I would land, and this is what I would think. It just so happens that we also make a claim, an audacious claim, that there's a greater sense of fulfillment and happiness there. And I want to give you a definition of fulfillment and happiness. Anybody can have a momentary interlude of pleasure and indulgence. How long does it last? Right? And its only significance is that you may be waiting after a period of time to repeat it. But does it create in you, within you, a sense of feeling more fulfilled as a human being and what your purpose is and how you're connecting to history and to the future. Big difference. I started out by saying there are three variables that govern all our activity. Time, place, and people. Somebody plays a violin on Shabbat when people are sleeping, it's a compounded infraction according to the halacha. Plays the same violin, the same melody, Saturday night, Mitzi Shabbos, after the Shabbat, at his friend's Sheva Brachot, the festivity of the week after the wedding, it's a mitzvah. So it's the configuration. The challenge is to harness pleasure, the energy of pleasure, and put it in the service of spirituality. Then it fuels the engines of human personality. To deny our need for pleasure is dishonest, and it doesn't work. It's not just pragmatically it doesn't work, but that's not the way God created us. He created us with a capacity for pleasure, and he didn't say, ha ha, I fooled you. He said, harness it. It's nuclear energy. You can turn it into electricity, or it can precipitate chaos. Context. Time, place, and people. You have the right configuration. How do I know what's the right configuration? Well, we go back to our source, to the Torah. The Torah has a game plan for where it works and how it's going to work most efficiently. Jewish identity can be something that's very superficial, could be something that's deeply embedded even in a non-religious Jew. There's a certain connection based on nostalgia, warmth, sentiment, but it's very hard, number one, to defend that unless we have a working thesis for how to, to articulate it. And that's rooted in knowledgeability, and in being informed, not uninformed, and being eligible to be an apicorus. The apicorus, the heretic in our generation, should be like the dodo bird. It should be a protected species, because most people, as I said, just they're not observant because it's easier to be not observant than observant. They just fall on that side of the fence because that's where they happen to land. But my life experience in the last 42 years in going around the world and meeting a lot of Jews, young and old, especially younger Jews, because younger people have more mobility the older somebody is, the more he's already invested in a certain life, and unconsciously at least, there's a certain ego commitment to protect that investment. Younger people, because they're still open to new horizons, usually have the capacity to make more audaciously courageous decisions. It's usually the way it is, and there are exceptions each time in every way. Okay, I'm going to end with this, fellas. And want any questions? I'm happy to take any questions. 
you tell a story of a Jew that was walking in a non-Jewish neighborhood in New York, an Italian-Irish neighborhood, and he's, he was, had to be there in business, a short young fellow, and stops into a bar to get a glass of beer, a pub, a bar, tavern, sits down and orders a glass of beer. And there are two big Irishmen on the other side of the counter, and they're having a contest. Take an orange and to see who can squeeze more juice out of the orange into a glass. After a little while, they take note of this little Jew sitting at the other end, and they throw an orange down to him. And they say, OK, Jew, now you go. So this little Jew says to them, you know what? Give me the orange you just squeezed. He said, the orange I just squeezed? He said, yeah, yeah. He takes the squeezed orange and takes it and re-squeezes it and fills up the whole glass with juice. And they're standing in awe, in amazement. How did you do that? So this particular fellow said, no problem. I'm a fundraiser for a Jewish organization. I know how to squeeze to the maximum. <laughs> I want to borrow that and use an analogy, fellas. I say life is an orange. Halacha teaches us how to squeeze the maximum pleasure out of it. Our claim is that if you go directly looking for the pleasure, it delivers less. If you put it in a structure, you put it in a context, you go back to who you are and why the world was created and your place in the world, then it's going to be more pleasurable, deliver more satisfaction, not less. That's our claim. How do you know whether it's true or not true? Take a look around while you're here. Study the sources. Look carefully at the people, at the communities, at the families that you see. Do the people seem to be more happy or less happy? Do the children seem to be more happy or less happy? Is that Mathematical proof? No, no. But if you're going the direction of Sherlock Holmes and you're trying to accumulate more evidence, be observant. And when I say observant, it means to, to see. To see, take note, and try and attain to a level of objectivity. Objectivity means what would I think if the pleasure was immediate, right? Somebody told you already that there's a code of law on the shelf. There's a shulchan aruch, and that code of law says certain things to do, certain things not to do. Right? Our claim is it works, and it brings more, precipitates more sense of fulfillment. How do you know I'm right? But before you evaluate the evidence, go through the following exercise. Make believe that the code of law does not say, don't eat non-kosher, put on tefillin, keep Shabbat. Make believe it does not say that. And instead, what does it say? Live like a libertine. Eat like a gourmand. Indulge every pleasure recklessly, randomly, every moment that you can. And on your day of judgment, your creator is going to say, how much pleasure did you take recklessly and randomly? Make believe that would be the code of law. And then go back and look at the same evidence. Would the evidence be more persuasive or less persuasive? I submit that for most people, the same evidence would be more persuasive because unconsciously it would suit their sense 
of need to indulge. And the act of courage is to get up and go the other direction. And finally, finally. It's brought in small and brought in book. I, I, I just recently came across it. Somebody pointed it out to me. But many years ago, I pointed out the two staples of the Jewish diet are salmon and herring, mostly in the Ashkenazic world, but even in the Sephardic world. Two interesting fish. All salmon and most herring swim upstream against the current to get to their breeding grounds. I say it's not accidental that they're staples of the Jewish diet. If you want to, you have an interest in producing another generation to get to your breeding grounds. You want to get to another generation, you have to be willing to swim upstream against the current and not do only that which is politically correct and fashionable. You have to have what we used to call in university, later when I left Brooklyn College and I went to Hopkins in the astronomy department, they used to have what they called Grand Unifying Theories. The acronym was GUTS. You want to have an audacious overview of wh who you are and what you are and have attained to a certain objectivity. Remember Mr. Goldberg who said, Remember, doctor, I'm a sugar. Thank you, fellas. <laughs>